Sir, could you start with your name and job title, please? My name is C.S. Chiwanza, and I'm a writer, cricket writer. Uh, that was a perfect chance for you to plug your, um, <laughs> your website. And I just feel like as a freelancer, you didn't do it. it. Is it any chance that you actually have an emailer that you would like to tell people about? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks for, <laughs> for helping me out there. Yeah, um, my work is found on chadrickdrive.substack.com. Um, you find a lot of information. If you're interested in the cricketers and their lives, their approach, how they became who they are, just come on through and subscribe. You will enjoy the content. It's becoming a very interesting place to go because it's like all the origin stories of all the Southern African players, uh, you know, Namibia, South Africa, Zimbabwe. Um, uh, so it, it's, a real, you know, if you are interested in all that sort of content, um, people should certainly head over there. But let's talk about the man that you wrote about recently, Anrik Nulkia. Um, the first, I think the first thing to say is that he is genuinely fast, isn't he? It's legitimately fast. He's fast, fast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's one of the fastest bowlers out of South Africa. And that's a big thing considering how many paces South Africa produces, you know. And I don't think there's anyone who who bowls consist consistently as fast as he does. And, and I think the, I think consistency is probably the major word, actually, that you just used there. It's... um. I wonder if Mark Wood is probably the only other bowler who probably regularly hits the high heights, but it is for me that consistency of pace and that he doesn't drop off pace either. And he doesn't have spells where he's, you know, he's lacking. He, he seems to always be above 90 miles an hour, you know, consistently at that mark. Um, he just is, he's kind of, he's a little bit of a machine when it comes to a pace bowler. Yeah, he is. And the, the thing about him, I think it's, the action. I don't think he was taught the action. He he was helped to improve it, but no one really taught him how to be that fast or to bowl the way he does. And the weirdest thing about that is, in the beginning, he had dreams of playing rugby, like most kids do in South Africa, especially when they don't go to the elite schools, you know, the elite cr cricketing schools. You know, he went to some... Brandwag, you know, it's not really known. And when I spoke to his coach, he told me that the people he mentioned did not even play first-class cricket in, in South Africa as some of their alumni. And so for someone to be that fast with that background, it's, it's a bit mind-blowing. Yeah, and it's also, it's, it's quite rare, isn't it, for a uh, top-level South African player now not to go to a school where other top-level South African players have gone to. Um, and so he did really break through from from a different region. Uh, uh, his childhood coach was Andreas Duplessis. Uh, uh, that was his high school coach, I should say. Um, what was he like when he was a young bowler? Was it always obvious that he was quick? Yeah, I think so. Because according to Duplessis, you know, even though he really liked his rugby, he did like his cricket a lot. And he, he used to bowl in the nets quite a lot. And he, he just had this fast action that he had. You know, he was always fast, but there was work to be done, but he was just fast. Yeah, and, you know, it's, the other thing about him now is that, you know, as, as we sort of move on with his career a little bit, is that even though he was very fast, he wasn't one of those people who was pushed when he was 18, 19, and 20. Um, you know, there wasn't this, there wasn't that sort of hype around him, like almost, you know, for me, it's like, you know, Brevis and, and Janssen and those sort of people, I heard whispers about them beforehand. And, you know, even someone like Devin Conway, I remember whispers around him, even though he didn't make it in South Africa, right? And, and you, you hear those sorts of stories about those sorts of players. Considering how consistently fast he is and what an almost machine-like athlete he is, it, it felt like he had a delayed start to his career. And it's really only been, what, maybe since the last two, two and a half years where he's really been at this level. Um, it's been a, sort of a constant rise rather than, oh, he's fast at 20, we'll get him in the team when he's 21 and see if he can hit some people in the head. Mm. Yeah, and you know, the... I think one of the reasons is from is because 
you know, where he's from, the Eastern Cape, you know, they they don't produce that many top class cricketers. And when you combine that with a school that he went to, there just was no hype for him. So he sort of had to work his way through the system as it were, you know. He played the under 15s, under 16s, you know, up and up and up. And even when he got to to the Warriors, you know, he did not immediately break through into the first team. He had to sort of pay his dues and, you know, play for Southwestern Districts and Eastern Province. He was fast, but he was always behind a few other bowlers. Who, who were some of the bowlers around that period who, like, like are they major bowlers or are they just like first class bowlers that were keeping him out of the spots <laughs> it was really first class bowlers <laughs> there were no major bowlers that were in his way i think i'm trying to remember uh if it comes to me i will let you know but he had just one bowler who was ahead of him and it wasn't even a top bowler not your dale stains not your you know yeah just first class not even a Martin Delanga type player, right? Like we're talking about, yeah, that sort of, yeah. And, and that again is incredible because you look at him now um, and he looks so complete as a player and to think that he wasn't pushed through the system away. And if you look at, where would we put him? We put him up with Rabada. Um, he would be up with um, uh, Jofra Archer, you know, um, uh, Pat Cummins on those sorts of levels as as far as, uh, you know, top level, top pace bowlers. All those guys were quite early on seen and developed and pushed ahead. And, you know, probably by the age of 19 and 20, everyone was already talking, well, in some of their cases, they were already playing for, for, for a country, but they were already being hyped up and, and talked about. So it's really interesting to see what what is, it's almost like he's a, like a hardworking, working class um, type of extreme fast bowler. And we don't get many of those. You get your Nancy Haywood type and Sean Tate, type bowlers you don't really get those sorts of guys who, who come through like even mark wood at a young age there was a lot of hype around his pace and you you go, you go to someone like england you know stuart meeker and Varun aaron in india and all these different places and then you've got this guy who quite obviously is that talent so it, it tells you a lot about his background and as you said the, the the lack of that posh school um you know to really push him is really interesting um tell me about when when he gets to first class cricket is it piet buta is he the one who is working with him yeah okay first i will just go back the the bowler was blocking his path was andrew burke I have no idea who that is. I feel like you've made up that name. <laughs> oh, Andrew I know Birch. everyone and I don't know who that is. <laughs> you Andrew Birch. Is that his yeah. name? Yeah. Andrew I'm, I'm going to Google and him while you talk. <laughs> I think his highest achievement was South Africa A. He never went beyond no, I'm, that. I'm, and I'm honestly looking at a picture of him now and he could be standing next to me in my office and I would not know who he is. Uh, Andrew Birch, let's have a look. 99 games. Uh, bowling average of 26. So yeah, just a really good, strong first-class uh, career, 330 wickets. N nothing wrong with him. But as you say, let's have a look. Yeah, South Africa under-19s and South Africa A. Um, that's a long way short of uh, a top IPL bowler and maybe one of the best test bowlers in the world at the moment. So uh, that really does tell you, you know, how different that situation was. Yeah, it, it does. And I think also... Maybe one thing that might have counted ag against him at the time was probably Birch's experience. Maybe he knew how to navigate batters better than than Anrik. But to come to what you were saying about his sort of work ethic, you know, and him and Pete Boiter. And I think <clears throat> before we get to, okay, Boiter sort of knew when he saw Anrik that this kid was talented. I mean... Uh, first sorry, him, do, where, did, where was Bolta, who was he working for at the time? Bolta was working with Eastern Province, he, the Eastern Province Academy. So the natural projection path for cricketers in, in the Eastern Cape is if you don't have the post school behind you, you know, you play provincial, and then if you're lucky, you get into the Eastern Cape Academy. And that's where... Pete Boita was. So he sort of had an eye on the kid because they saw him when he was 17 and he was bowling rockets. 
but he's he was still a little rough around the edges. So when he eventually made it to a year later, when he made it to the academy, they did a little bit of work, but at that point he wasn't quite strong enough to to take the step up. You know, he was just yep. fast. And I think at the time also, one thing that might have counted against him was that he did not have the consistency that he later developed. Yeah, I mean, the consistency is really interesting. The other person uh, that you mentioned, uh, was it Drikas Simon? I don't know how to pronounce that at all. I've probably done all that wrong. Yeah, Drikas, um, he's now with the Pakistan team and he's their s and But um, <clears throat> Drikas also is another local guy, you know, as it were. So Drikas was doing strength and conditioning for for the Warriors. And Anrik likes a braai, I think, <laughs> because <laughs> when he got his IPO call, I think he was having a braai. And his transformation also happened, it began at a braai. I mean, he was invited to a braai by Drikas and there was everyone, you know, Cliff Deacon was the physio for the Warriors and a, a, a bunch of other guys. So Anrik felt that he needed to do something special to overtake Andrew Bush. So sat down with the guys, particularly Drika Simon. And then he told them, look, I need to bowl faster. And he was already fast at that point, but he felt mm -hmm. that he needed to bowl faster to sort of blow everyone out of the water. And so the only thing that Drika could do for him was to get him stronger so that he could achieve that consistency. And it was like um, a four-week program that they they had to undergo. You know, in the first month, first week, just general strength training, and then they would develop it from there until, you know, I think, then let me just look it up. Uh, I, I keep forgetting these things. <laughs> It's all right. So, yeah, you know, general strength to endurance strength. I think the most difficult part for Anrik and was the endurance part because they had to build endurance within him. And I'm not quite privy to the details, but what I've heard is that was the, the killer. That is what made him as strong as he was. And... After that, they did the explosive strength for him to be able to bowl at, the, at that high, high speed. And then finally, he was handed over to to put to Boita again because now he was stronger and now Boita could work on the biomechanics of his deliveries. So, I mean, it, you know, it does sound like a story of he didn't have a lot of skills, but he was fast enough to be in the system, right? And then you've got these two guys, one of which just molded his technique a little bit. And the other one basically gave him the ability to bowl that little bit faster. But I think maybe the most important thing is, is the ability to bowl faster for longer than other people. And I, it'd be really interesting. I, I, I know that South Africa never used him this way and you probably never would, but it feels like, I don't know if you, you probably, you, you might be old enough to remember that Patrick Patterson would sometimes bowl these really long spells for the West Indies. We'd bowl really long, fast spells. And we haven't had anyone do that. I'm trying to think of who the last player was, but you know, Pat Cummins maybe occasionally does it, but it's not a thing. It's not how we use fast bowlers anymore, but you could actually use him in that, almost that dual role of bowling seven or eight overs from one end, but doing it at 90, 92, 93 miles an hour. And that's kind of what those two guys built, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. They sort of built a machine, and you know, and the 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 cool thing is, he does not have a lot of. Until now, I don't think he has a lot of change ups. You know, mm. he steams in, bowls really fast, and uses pace to destabilize the the better. And because he has that consistency and that endurance with, within him, and on the other end, we have guys like Lungi who bowl short spells, you know, mm. because you cannot risk bowling Lungi for long spells. Otherwise, you might bowl him into the ground. So when you have someone like Anrich bowling on one end, you can sort of 
you know, give him a longish spell, drown the be- the opposition under a barrage of fast bowlers the way he does it, you know, it's a very good thing to think about. But then they use him sparingly, which is sort of a, a bit weird. Well, I, I suppose it's just a protection thing. Is Also... It, South Africa have five bowlers in their lineup, so they can use him that way, which which also makes sense. I think the interesting thing is, so I first saw him, I think it was when he played the India series against, um, when he was on, on tour in India, and he bowled almost gun barrel straight. Then you see him play against England, again, bowled very, very straight, right? And I'm thinking, okay, well, he can bowl 90, 10, 95 miles an hour, but he's got, he's got an action that's easy to read, so I think a lot of players wouldn't, it's not just the pace that would bother them. And he's not moving the ball sideways. Now, you watch the ball that he bowled to, to um, Johnny Bairstow. That's a wobble ball that came back massively um, uh, in that first test. But you also watch him in the IPL. Most, most bowlers, I mean, you, uh, have one change-up ball, you know, one kind of slow ball that they go for. He was bowling three different ones in that IPL season that, that he did. He seems to have this ability to pick up skills really, really quickly from the time he decides to learn them. And I think it must go back to that thing with uh, Piet Boto and Drika Simon of like literally, um, you know, of changing his body in a month and then changing his technique in a few weeks after that, right? And he has this ability to pick up skills really quickly. So you've got someone who's, he's not young, right? We talked about it took him a long time to sort of push through the South African domestic um, uh, lineup. He's now 20, 28, right? But if you look at what he has gone from, if you watch him bowl three years ago compared to now, it's a different kind of bowler. He has so much more skill, so much more kind of variety. Um, I, I just feel that he's he must be a very good learner, but it must take him, I don't know, he must have to make a really clear decision to learn. Does that make sense? Where, you know, he it's almost like he went, okay, fix fitness. Okay, fix technique. Okay. <laughs> get the ball to move sideways. Okay, now I need to be able to bowl slower balls. And yet, I can't think of too many bowlers who have the ability to nail all those things. And what if you, what you're talking about here is probably a five, six year process. And yet every year, he seems to be a completely different kind of player than he was the year before, while always being fast as hell. Well, I think <laughs> I just realized this. I think the, the weirdest thing is his coach, uh, from high school, Duplessis. When I got in touch with him to ask about Anrich, he says, from when Anrich was a teen, his favorite quote is an, an Andrew Brees quote that says, you're either getting better or getting worse. You are never s- staying the same. So I suppose when, when you live your life with that mantra in your head, mm. it makes the learning process easier because you stand still then you are not moving forward which means you are moving backwards in his mind so the reinvention becomes not reinvention the upskilling becomes easier yeah and i think also the other thing i'm i'm not quite sure but my assumption is because boita helped him with the biomechanics that probably suit him better or best, you know, it makes it very easy for him to sort of adapt new techniques to his bowling because he has the perfect um, action for him, which makes it easier for him to sort of play around with. Mm. I mean, because you look at a lot of international bowlers, uh, he was probably always going to get to, well, he's probably above 90 mile an hour before they, they fixed his fitness and, and everything else. He could probably touch above 90 miles an hour. And let's say that that's all that happens is they fix his action a little bit and he gets fitter and he bowls at, you know, 92, 93, up to 95 miles an hour occasionally. He's still going to have a good career because that is a marketable skill, right? He's still going to travel around the world. He's still going to end up in all these franchises. You know, I mean, Martin Delanga is you know, has had a decent professional career being able to do that, played some international uh, cricket, became a coal pack, you know, has played in some leagues, all that sort of stuff. The interesting thing is that it, my biggest frustration with a lot of cricketers is that they don't then have that mindset that you were talking about before of 
uh, okay, well, I'm going to add this now. I'm going to add this now. And a lot of them say they want to be the best in the world, but they basically stay true to the, the core thing that they're good at. And his core thing, uh, you know, that he's good at is pace. He could have just spent all of his time as almost like a Tino Best type player. If I was like, it's going to be pace, 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 and pace. The ability to match that up with all those other skills is what changes him into probably he's not as skillful as someone like Ryan Harris, but he's probably a little bit faster than Ryan Harris. And obviously his body's a little a lot more durable than Ryan Harris, but that ability to be able to move the ball at 95 miles an hour, Mark Wood doesn't really have that. I know Mark Wood can move the ball sideways and, and can tail it and all those sorts of things. But if he can match um, bowling 92 to 95 miles an hour consistently with the wobble ball, with swinging it occasionally, with seaming it when he needs to, and with slower balls, it's like that's almost like the next evolution beyond, you know, that that's even because he's quicker than Pat Cummins, right? And he's consistently quicker than Pat Cummins. That is for me just it, it, it allows him to be this other kind of bowler. But we already know that the um the 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 stress of him bowling that fast has bothered his body. So he had a bunch of hip injuries, um, a bunch of back injuries. Cricket South Africa never really discussed what it was that he had. He just sort of disappeared. We saw him came come back in that last IPL, not really look himself. Obviously, look, he's looked fantastic at times against England here. But, it, you know, there have been times where it is very hard to bowl consistently as quick as he does. Um, is he already starting to think, you know, at 28 that he might need to do what Sean Pollock and Pat Cummins and kind of every other fast bowler in the world has done and, and pull back? Or do you think he's the sort of guy that will be this like, no, if I'm going to bowl, it's going to be in the 90 mile an hour range? Well, <clears throat> that is interesting because I can sort of see that, like we all saw with, with Lungi. Ngidi was very fast as a youngster. But mm -hmm. then after the injuries, he had to sort of remodel himself, re rethink the approach. He does bowl fast, very fast at times, but not consistently because he holds back. But with Anrik, I think the upskilling might be like an exit plan so that he stays relevant for longer. But I also see him as this guy with a strong-mindedness to keep going as fast as he can until he, he no longer is able to do that. I think it's, it might be sort of a mentality. I, I picked up this phrase that, you know, there's a small franchise mentality where you feel like you have to constantly prove yourself because you are from that little franchise that no one looks at. So I think he might have that. And my assumption is he will keep going as fast as he can until he just cannot and he has to re to change and, you know, go to lower speeds. But I, I, I see him going as fast as he can for the next couple of years or so. Because, I mean, you look at, He's bowling, and obviously the reason we're talking about him is because he's fast, because it's awesome, um, and, and because I'm, uh, you know, low key obsessed with him. But when he bowls to the tail, for instance, right, he's not just bouncing them all the time. I think he might have. I can't remember if it was in a press conference or if it was for to for dose, but uh, he was talking about the fact that he doesn't try and bounce the tail as much. Like it was a, it's a, it's not an accident that he doesn't bounce the tail, right? So there is a lot of thinking to his bowling that perhaps you know we we don't see because it's hard for us to see beyond the 95 mile an hour you know beast that he is so there, there certainly is that um but it is interesting that he is still trying to even at 90 and 95 miles an hour he's still trying to use his skills a lot more than perhaps maybe the generation before him would have and and i go back the, the two obvious ones are probably as i said before you know um nancy haywood and um and sean tate of just like well i'm very fast so i'm going to break through you with purely with speed even though he's probably in that pace bracket and you can put mark wood in that in in that kind of bracket as well it does feel that he wants to be known as someone who can hit the top of off stump who, who will work batters out, right? And he'll go for runs, which is fine. But th there does seem to be a slightly different element and a different thinking. I suppose what I'm saying is there's less of that sort of wild man fast bowler in him, uh, you know, trying to hit tail enders on the head and everything else. Um, is that something that came through, uh, you know, when you were talking to the people who knew him well? Yeah, I think uh, one thing that 
did come up a couple of times was that he's a he's a thinking cricketer. You know, he he you know, there's this perception that fast bowlers, you know, they they just run in and hurl fast things towards batters, you know. But um there's there's a bit of thinking and he has always been like that. I mean, when he was still an academy player, bowling on flat pitches, he would not just try to bounce the opposition out. He would try various things, various lengths. You know, he would always try something to help the team move forward. Where, I think, as you said, you know, in the past, you, you have someone as fast as Anri, you have the tail, you bounce them out. It's a no-brainer because, you know, but then Anri has never been like that. He has never liked to play like that. He He's always try, tried to outthink, maybe try to set up the bowler, the, the better, I mean, you know, maybe a surprise yorker here, a surprise bouncer there. For him, the bouncer is a su- surprise delivery. It's not something to expect. You know, um, he's not your regular enforcer type. No, no, definitely. Uh, but he is he is a type of personality within South Africa. So Charles Langevout called him a proper Dutchman. Uh, you know, we've talked about this before. I think Sean Pollock was the first person I think who ever I heard um, refer to him as a proper, uh, as a proper Dutchman. But th- there's no doubt that that there is something. So a proper Dutchman means an Afrikaans person, but it means a specific type of Afrikaans person, doesn't it? It means uh, the sort of Afrikaans person. I think I once wrote this about Andre Nell. I might've mentioned this on a recent podcast. So apologies if I have to everyone listening, but um, I think I once wrote that, you know, Andre Nell is the sort of person who would bowl um, uphill into, into a, uh, a cyclone with a piano on his back. Um, and there's a bit of that with, Nokia, and that's what I was talking about before. That I mean, Neil Wagner is the other person in probably modern cricket who gets referred to as a proper Dutchman, you know, uh, a, a fair bit as well. There is something about that psyche of just w- literally they will work themselves almost to the bone. And you watch him as a fast bowler. It's not like he's shell back there and he's bowling three overs and he's going off for a spell. Like literally, he will just continue to plow through that crease for as long as anyone makes him. That 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 is an archetype within, especially South African cricket, but South African culture. When you're talking about Afrikaans men, mm. you know, I think it's the, yeah, you know, in Afrikaans, I think you you have heard this a lot. You know, there are three three pillars: family, God, and sport. Most of the time, is rugby. So. But then, you know, when you have those three pillars, you know, you give your all to all of them. You know, you will not rest until you have achieved the best that you can for all the three. And as you say, it's something that is so prevalent, you know, especially in the Afrikaans community. And when you're strong as he is, you know, I think Boita's favorite story is when Anrik sort of didn't let go of the ball when they're bowling, when they were, they were playing in Namibia, and he was a young man. They had a spinner on one end, and Anri, and it was a flat pitch, dead, dead. But he he felt he could do something with the ball. He kept running in, trying everything that he could, bowling as fast as he could. And on the other hand, the spinner just took wickets, and Anrik was happy because he was doing something meaningful with the ball, destabilizing the batters, giving the spinners a chance. So it's that kind of psyche, as you mentioned, that is within him. He will sort of run himself to the ground for the team, as it were. I think my my favorite story of him is really random, considering that I love watching him bowl. But do you remember, and I, I th- I'm going to say it was in Pretoria, I think it was in Pretoria, where he batted for three hours against the England uh, against England um so it must have been whoa, within his first five tests I would have thought and it was like it was really you know Paul Harris Ash uh, you know uh, uh you know um uh I'm trying to think you know Jason Gillespie style batting there was like no back lift it was just like I'm just gonna stay here as long as I can and he batted for hours and hours and you just got this feeling that there was there was something really about him within his psyche that was destined to get the most out of himself. And at that stage, if he disappeared, I don't think anyone in South Africa would have been going, oh, we've lost one of our 
you know, our best bowlers. Everyone would have been like, oh, we played a few games and he left. And it really is, you could see from that batting innings and how much, how much he, he prides his fitness, how much he tries and all that sort of stuff. This is a person who has done everything he can to get the absolute most out of himself. You know, you mentioned the batting. I asked because I've always felt that he sort of loves his betting. Like, you, you know, the, the tail ender who just loves his betting. And I asked around and the, and the response was the same. He will, his eyes light up when he's putting on his pads to go into the nest to do his betting practice. You know, he doesn't see himself as an all-rounder or that he, he could grow into one. Like, for example, like how Cassius does. does. Cash sees himself as a, a prospective all-rounder, but not Anrich. Anrich just thinks that as long as he can bet as best as he can, he might help the team. He doesn't like mind not scoring runs. He will defend all day if needs be. You know, he has that. It's sort of wrong to say single-mindedness, but <laughs> because, you know, once you say single-mindedness, you, you sort of r remove the the whole aspect that is a thinking cricketer. But then he has that doggedness about him. When he sets his mind on something, he will put in 110% as, as Duplessis says. You know, he will go quietly about his business. Three out of four days a week when he was in high school, three out of four days a week, you would find him in the nets, either alone or with someone throwing if he's with someone, someone is throwing balls at him. If he's alone, he's running in and bowling as fast as he can. And, and you know, you can see all that in his game. But uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Chadwick Drive is your emailer. Just get yourself another plug in there. Uh, but thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Hey, thank you. I, I, I enjoyed my time. Amrik is a, a special guy. Mm -hmm.